everybody. Uh, so we have to. Hi, everyone. Hi. Yes. OK. Um, hello, evening, everybody. everybody. Good morning. Good evening. Sorry for being late. We had some technical problems. I'm Hannes Wertner. I'm the main organizer of this lecture series on digital humanism. And I would like to thank you all for joining. Um, we have today, we have a, a panel on a hot and very political topic. In essence, it's on the concentration in the web and the issue of sovereignty and also the respective European answer. Uh, the topic is central to our digital humanism initiative, which is not only to describe and analyze the interplay of man and machine, but also to create a world where IT and digitalization serve the people, so where the human is at the center of our activities. The panel is very high level. I would like to thank them all, and they, the individual panelists will be introduced by George Metakidis, who will moderate. It's Bella Di Castillo from the European Parliament, Locke Morel from the Tilburg University, and Ivo Folman from the European Commission. Um, the organization is that we first have the three presentations and talk, and then there is a discussion which, and at the end we have a music, as each time we have a piece of music selected, and this time by Peter Knees and Stefanie Vogovic. Uh, before handing over to George, I would like to thank uh, the panelists and the moderator who also organized this panel. Very short to George Metakidis, who is well known, uh, he's active in our digital humanism initiative since the beginning. He's active on the economic, political, and social impact of IT, cybersecurity, data protection, and he's also very active in promoting international cooperation. Uh, he's also, he has several uh, activities. Uh, he's visiting and a junk professor at the University of Southampton. He's also at the European University of Cyprus. He's the president of the Digital Enlightenment Forum uh, in Brussels, which has similar objective as our initiative. From the education, he is a mathematician, uh, especially mathematical logic from Cornell, where he made his PhD. He was at MIT and Cornell and Rochester University. And since 84, he is also in the European Commission. He was the director of the Esprit program. He was also central for the design of the ISD program. And he also was active in contributing to the establishment of international institutions such as the World Wide Web Consortium in 93. And I'm not going to list a number of awards and honorary degrees and membership in several national academies. And we are happy to have you with us, George. And now the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hannes. And uh, we have a late start, but we'll, we'll, we'll catch up. We're, we're 10 minutes, uh, no, uh, eight minutes, actually. Uh, Hannes just said in the beginning of his introduction uh, that, that digital humanism has, has, uh, has the, the goal to, to shape technologies in according with, with human values. Well, Europe uh, will not be able to, to help effectively do this unless she becomes master of her digital future, unless uh, she achieves a, a degree of digital sovereignty. And the success of the currently unfolding European data strategy is crucial for achieving this goal. So this strategy can be viewed in my take as consisting of three pillars. The first pillar is regulation, the soft power of Europe with, with potential for global impact. So on, on February the 4th, the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, uh, uh, speaking at the Digital Masters Conference said that Europe is sitting on a gold mine of data which remains unexploited. To remedy this, uh, clear rules on how to access, uh, share, and sell or buy data are needed. So here comes the Data Governance Act, which was published last November. So that's one. There's also the Data Act, 
and a specific program on European health data spaces that are coming later this year in 2021. So this is happening in, in the regulation front that we discussed previously uh, in, this, uh, in this forum. Uh, but as we also discussed before, regulation alone is not, can never be enough. It does help to create a level playing field. Uh, it does make the field, the playing field more fair, but uh, uh, we need more to enable European players to play on this field and grow to become competitive uh, at the global level, in particular with their American and, uh, and Chinese counterparts. So we come to the second pillar. The second pillar is the European digital internal market. Now, this is not a new initiative, but it's not completed yet. When completed, European players can look at an unhindered market, that's the word that uh, uh, Ursula von der Leyen used, of 500 million consumers. We're not there yet. And the third pillar is money, uh, money and investments. And there, there is something new to the, to the funding instruments that everybody's familiar with. And that is the next generation EU recovery plan uh, that has a price tag of 750 billions. As many of you know, 20% of that is earmarked for digital investments. So that makes about 150 billion, which is expected to leverage much more via institutions like the European Investment Bank and investments at the national level from both the public and the private sector. So just as an example of where such investments could go, uh, the European Commission president mentioned uh, a, a European cloud service, a European cloud service uh, using the experience of Gaia X. Now, how this will happen, I do not know, uh, but, but uh, it, it's an example of where investments uh, could go. Now, all of this makes for a very complex strategy, and as always with such strategies, timing is of the essence. When will this happen? How will they interweave with each other? Uh, it's as in every strategy. I mean, uh, in uh, 1815 in Waterloo, Marshall Blucher had timed his move differently. We might all be speaking French today. So uh, to, to, to help us wrap our minds around all this, uh, we're fortunate to have an excellent panel. And, uh, and so let's get uh, started. I will introduce each speaker as the speaker is about to take the floor. So I start with our first speaker, who is Pilar del Castillo. Uh, she is a professor of political science and a former minister of education and culture in Spain until 2004. In 2004, she gets elected as a member of the European Parliament. And it is not a hyperbole to say that since then, she has been uh, it, the most active and influential member where digital issues are concerned in the European Parliament. She played the key role in landmark uh, policies like the Telecom Single Market Regulation, the NIS Directive, that's the Network Information Service Security, uh, the Digital Agenda Regulation amongst them. And she's currently co-chair of the Artificial Intelligence and Digital Intergroup, and very active in AIDA. AIDA is the special committee on AI in a digital age. And I want to add something which is not in the short CV that you have received, namely that she, she has been the chair and the driving force behind the, the European Internet Foundation, the AIF. And the AIF, in fact, earlier today, uh, had a panel discussion entitled the EU Industrial Policy for Digital Leadership. So I could not imagine a more appropriate, suitable speaker to set the scene, the overall policy scene for the discussion that is going to follow. So, Pierre Pilar, the floor is yours and the microphone too. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, to start, I want to thank you, thanking Professor Metakides for inviting me to this event. 
And after that introduction, I'm going to hire you for my next uh, you know, events and meetings. And then you can introduce my, myself uh, because uh, you can introduce uh, to me, uh, you know, because that was such a, uh, a display of uh, generosity in your words that uh, I really thank you very much for that. Well, um, in some way, uh, your introduction and my um, speech uh, now, my intervention, uh, is going to be, you know, in some way, not overlapping, but going in, in a very uh, similar directions. I'm going to give you an overview of the state of play. We are uh, taking into account mostly uh, the aim of this debate, which I understand is related to the concept of uh, data colonialism on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, to what extent we are developing a kind of uh, human-centric uh, approach to the digitalization process in, in Europe. So taking into account these uh, two aspects, uh, let me start saying that, uh, well, uh, there is uh, no doubt that the COVID-19 pandemic has drastically impacted our daily lives. Uh, the health crisis uh, can be perceived as a digital accelerator that has taken us uh, 10 years into the future. Uh, for example, we suddenly are much more aware of the need for communication services, uh, tools for remote collaborations, uh, and fast and reliable access to data, whether it is from the office, uh, the home, or somewhere in between. Uh, this is the context in which the EU is giving its next steps into the digital transformation. In the past years, the institutions have made major advances, for example, in terms of connectivity with electronic communication code, elevating privacy to a guiding principle through the GDPR. On the other hand, banning unjustified geoblocking or ensuring content portability. Today, a step forward has to be taken in a central element for the development of a globally competitive digital economy and society. And I am referring to data. We have entered in an era where data is the enabler for more personalized services and products, innovative business models, and more efficient public administrations. Today's uh, massive uh, data sets uh, together with the vast sophistication of computing capacity represent a giant, a gigantic, I would say, leap that confront us uh, to new and urgent challenges. So let's go for the challenges. What challenges uh, do we face to fully participate in the data economy? Let's start with the first. Uh, for sure, one of the most important and urgent, I would say, is the need to provide Europe with the computerized uh, devices, a system and process that are necessary to enable the use of data. In other words, to provide Europe with the adequate digital infrastructure. According to the commission, while the EU currently consumes only one third of high performance computing resources worldwide, it provides only around 5%. The figures, uh, in my view, cannot longer be acceptable. Uh, let us not forget that um, Europe remains dependent on US chip makers. Three American companies dominate the global chip market. China, on the other hand, is leading in supercomputing research, and it is number one and number two on the list of the highest performing computer in the world. At this uh, stage of affairs in which uh, the terms uh, digital sovereignty and strategy autonomy uh, have made their way into all the EU recent debates. In my view, these are important concepts that must be understood, amongst other things, as a strong catalyst for Europe to have sufficient autonomy on digital infrastructure. And this is, for example, the case of initiatives such as uh, GaiaX, 
and now the recent created European Cloud Alliance. However, we must prevent an EU approach to digital policies that entails a protectionist uh, narrative that would lead us uh, to the wrong path. On the contrary, we have a great opportunity to reinforce and exploit our strengths and global level. So we have to be really very cautious with this interpretation of a certain kind of protectionism, which is against what we need in terms of open market and competition and so on and so forth. We need uh, to strengthen our resources, but we need to keep uh, an open economy. Well, and now we enter into the second important challenge we face. Um, which is uh, not to lose the EU's core values with, when leaping into the digital transformation. Individuals must play a central role in the digital process. Uh, and for that, trust is the key element. Without trust, they cannot do so. I mean, so uh, that we'll, uh, we'll have a, we will have a lack of uh, participation, we have a lot of confidence, and uh, that will affect to the way in which uh, digital transformation will develop in, uh, in this case, in Europe. Uh, and this is precisely the main goal of the GD uh, GDPR, and must also be the future of the e-privacy directive. Likewise, um, current proposals that are at the table, such as the Digital Market Act, the Digital Service Act or the Data Governance Regulation have at their core principles and values that all of the member states uh, share. This is important because they were embedded in all these proposals. For example, uh, under the Digital Service Act, uh, binding obligation will apply, including new procedures uh, for fast removal of illegal content, as well as comprehensive prote protection for users' fundamental rights online. On the other hand, the digital single market is designed to guarantee the principles of a competitive and open market by banning practices uh, of gatekeepers that include the unfair use of data from businesses operating on these platforms or situation where users are locked in to a particular service and have limited options to switching to another one. Finally, the data governance regulation through the establishment of personal data spaces will ensure that Europeans gain more control over the data and decide on a detailed level who will get access to the data and for what purpose. Surely, defending all these values is not exclusively of the European Union. We live in a global world that requires a global perspective. Hence, the European project will only advance to the extent we are capable of working together, adopting the necessary integrated policies, as well as firmly cooperating with other regions of the world with which we share common values. In this context, 60 years after the Treaty of Rome, we are confronted with the most far-reaching transformation of uh, the economy and society, which is defined by digitalization. To face this process, it will be paramount for Europe to complete the digital single market. In that respect, beyond any doubt, the European Union provides unique and extraordinary conditions to seize all the new opportunities that uh, we can have for really uh, seize uh, well, all, all, the, all the possibilities um, in, this, in that context. We have not to forget that uh, with 90% uh, of a global GDP and more than 440 million consumers, the EU has the necessary assets and economy of scale for developments such as cloud computing, big data, data-driven science, robotics, AI, uh, IoT, and of course, uh, 5G. Digitalization in general, and data in particular, must be seen as a game changer 
for the competitiveness of our economy and especially, I must say, of, for our industry in the economy. Indeed, Europe um, holds large amounts of public and industrial data with a potential that is yet underused. Advantages that will prove available with exponential growth of IoT in a data economy. From a different perspective, our intertwined industrial fabric composed of micro SMEs and large players with its chain of productivity scattered through the entire EU will contribute to maximizing the growth potential of digitalizing Europe's industry. Lastly, um, it is absolutely essential uh, to take a look, a very careful look, very close look to education, to digital skills. The EU must, on the one hand, uh, contribute to developing a skilled and competitive uh, workforce, paying extreme attention to the digital adaptation of workers and job seekers. And on the other hand, European institutions must to promote a reskilling revolution that supports from a very young age digital skills and competences in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, entrepreneurship, and creativity. A good example of that is coding. Up to now, the challenge for students was to understand the physical world. This challenge was reflected in the school curriculum by the types of science courses being taught. Today, a new different challenge is to understand and harness data information and knowledge. This should not have any negative impact on the learning of other core subjects. Above all, a truly transformative digital society requires individuals with a very well training judgment, capable of understanding the new environment in which they operate. For this reason, it is essential to combine science, math, and technology with a solid human, humanist uh, knowledge. I think this is uh, extremely important. I want to end underline the combination of these uh, two types uh, of uh, education which sometimes, uh, because uh, the, the importance uh, now of uh, science, math, and so on, uh, humanist knowledge is undermining. And I think, on the contrary, at this time, uh, it is more uh, necessary than never. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Pilar. Thank you. Uh, you, uh, you're back, you're back, we can, we can see you now. During the last part of your presentation, the sound was coming loud and clear, but your, your video feed uh, uh, stopped. But now, uh, so, now, so now. sorry, I mean, I was uh, sorry, sorry for that. It was my fault because, yeah, I, 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 I noticed, but I didn't want to touch uh, at that time uh, the screen, uh, just in case uh, you lose even my voice. So, so sorry for that. I, I will I, stay I, now I, with the image. <laughs> I fully understand. I fully understand, but uh, you, it, it, it's fine. I mean, it's uh, and thank you, and thank you again. So uh, we now come to uh, to our second speaker, Eva Bowman, who is the acting director of the Data Directorate of DigiConnect of, of the European Commission. He is a doctor of law by training. Uh, but has had extensive experience with the Dutch Ministry of Economic Affairs in the areas of industrial and technology policy, which is what we're talking about. Uh, his responsibilities in the European Commission, uh, which he joined in 98, focus on the European strategy for information market digitization and data, both on the regulatory and on the, on the funding front. So he is singularly well qualified uh, to, to, to help us understand what the EU plans to do with this uh, data gold mine that Ursula von der Leyen talked about. What are the constituent parts of, 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 of the strategy and how do they fit 
together. Evo, it's all yours now. Yes, thank you, George, and many thanks for inviting me um, to this panel. Now, in the coming 15 minutes, I'm going to talk about the uh, European data strategy indeed, and what's the thinking behind it, and, and these concepts of the data spaces and data governance, what, what do we mean when we talk about that, uh, right? Now, um, the data strategy, it came out on the 19th of February last year, and that really seems so incredibly long ago. Um, all the things that have happened in the meantime, right? You just think back to yourself. And at the same time, I think that the crisis, the COVID crisis has really shown the importance of data uh, to everyone. Um, aren't we all glued to our screens to compare what's happening in the different member states in the different regions, uh, number of cases, uh, the number of people have recovered, et cetera, et cetera. And at the same time, we have seen how much um, data is important also for finding solutions, for finding a way out of the lockdowns and for uh, informing the policies of the, of the different member states. Now, at the same time, the crisis has shown a lot of weaknesses, a lot of problems, um, ranging from uh, usability of actually the data from one hospital in another hospital um, to the comparability of some very simple things like, well, what do you mean by someone who died from COVID? Um, that kind of basic things are not defined in the same way uh, in, in the different member states. So if we had had a common European data space for health in place, just imagine such a data space, right? Where, where data is shared, where data is used, where data is defined in the same way. Couldn't, have we, couldn't we have acted much more efficiently and faster? Uh, so, so I think the, the COVID crisis really has, has taught us some things there. Let me go to the next slide. Um, so obviously health is in everyone's minds, but beyond the COVID crisis, um, the use of data is really going to be essential for our economy and for our society. Um, so data is an essential ingredient for artificial intelligence. It also helps uh, our industries to be more efficient. So job creation will depend uh, largely on data. Um, actually, it's, it's, it's quite uh, easy material for startups to work with. You need a computer and you need data and the capital investment that is needed for SMEs is not so big. So you can start a company quite easily based on, on data, but then you need the data first. Now, of course, it's not only important for the economy, it's also important for the society. Huh? Um, data will help us to lead longer, healthier lives. It will help us to... Um, lower our energy consumption, to live greener lives. It will make it easier for us to, to uh, move around uh, our, our cities. So data really can, can make this contribution to, to tackle societal challenges. Um, the, the data strategy um, has a very upbeat tone. It's very optimistic about what Europe can achieve in this in this area. How come, you may ask, uh, haven't we lost the race already a bit to the to the platforms? Aren't they going just to continue hoovering up all data and use it? Now, no, um, we have not lost the race in the data space. Why not? Well, actually, there's two reasons. The first reason is that the data that's being used now um, the 33 zettabytes that we had in 2018. Actually, that will be 175 zettabytes in 2025. Okay, look at the, the difference. Um, the big data is still to come. What we have now is small beer compared to what there will be in 2025. That is one reason. Another reason is that technologies are changing. Technologies for using the data. Um, for the moment, around 20% uh, of the data processing is happening in a decentralized way near the IoT devices. 80% is uh, actually processed in a much more centralized way uh, in a centralized cloud. Now that percentage is going to uh, change around uh, massively in the coming years. And we expect that actually 20% uh, of the processing will happen in a centralized way and 80% will happen near to the devices. For example, smart cars or connected cars, where actually you need to be close to the object in order to make sense of the data, because if not, you can't break in time, right? So these two elements, more data and 
technological change uh, make us so optimistic about the future? Okay, um, the European strategy for data on the next slides. Um, what we want to do is to do data in the European way. Now, what does it mean? Well, we want to create a real single market for data and that has really four components. The, the first component is that data should be able to flow within the EU and across the different sectors. Now there we have, of course, already the free flow of data regulation in place that was adopted under the, the last uh, mandate of the European Commission. Now, um, a second element is we need data available, high quality data to create and innovate. Think about SMEs and what they can do with the data. It's really important to increase the, the availability of data. All of this has to be done in full respect of European rules and European values. Um, I'm thinking there in particular of the GDPR. We have to make sure that people feel comfortable with making data available and that the GDPR is fully respected. And last but not least, we need clear rules for the access and use of data, um, fair, practical, and clear rules. Now, sometimes the data protection and data use are pitched against each other. Each other. And I don't think we should fall into this trap. Um, data use, a good data use, and a strong data protection are actually two sides of the same model. Um, and they can go hand in hand. They're part of a proactive and conscious way of handling uh, data. Okay, what is the data strategy doing on the next slide? Well, there's uh, four pillars, actually. Um, the first pillar is about um, regulation, making sure that we have the right rules in place for data access and, and data use. And I will go into the different instruments uh, later in the presentation. Um, then we need to make sure, as, as Pilar also said, we need to have uh, the infrastructures in place. We have to have the enablers in place um, to make sure that there is a European data infrastructure that we can, that we can rely on. <clears throat> and we need to invest in that. And that's what also announced in the um, data strategy, building on initiatives that were already hoovering around like, like Gaia-X, uh, that was a, a German French initiative, but actually we should turn those initiatives into European initiatives. Competences. Skills, a third pillar, really important, sometimes forgotten. It's about empowering individuals uh, to make sure that they can make informed choices. If we give them uh, more possibilities to control their data, they must do it in a in a conscious way. And of course, there is the uh, the digital skills in in general um, to make sure that everyone has the basic skills on handling data. <clears throat> then we also need the expertise, the top people who can actually make the difference in, in the data economy. So both layers are really important. It's the general skills, but also to make sure that we get uh, the top data people who can make the difference. Now, last but not least, the strategy um, foresees the rollout of European data spaces. Um, isn't that confusing? We spoke about the European data space, that's the, the, the overall single market, and now these data spaces, what, what are they? Um, I will show you on the, the next slide. The, when discussing um, in the preparation of the data strategy, we realized that um, you cannot have a one size fits all um, approach to all the different sectors. If you look at the health sector, the type of data is a lot of personal data. There's a lot of public sector involvement, right? You cannot treat that type of data in the same way as uh, manufacturing data, uh, where it's mostly non-personal data, where there's a strong driving role by, by industry. So um, that brought us to the idea to create common European data spaces. Now, what is such a data space? Um, if you ask the engineers in the European Commission, or, or actually mostly, they will start talking about data infrastructures and the fantastic things you can do with cloud and, 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 and everything around that, right? And the tools. If you ask the lawyers, they will start talking about 
regulation. They will start talking about agreements between partners. Uh, they will start talking about co-regulation, self-regulation. Now, actually, um, the two things go hand in hand. We are not going to um, ensure that these data spaces are in place if we don't tackle the two things at the same time. So that's why this is really part of uh, a strategy where the regulation and also the funding go in the same direction. And indeed, uh, we would like member states to uh, invest uh, also in the data infrastructures through the RRF and in the common data spaces, the data cleaning, the data preparation. Um, okay, I go to my next slide, which is actually also the last one. It's about the, the legal instruments that have been announced in the data strategy. Now, the first one and second one are on the table. The first one is the Data Governance Act. Um, the main goal is ensuring trust, trust in data transactions. It's about uh, making more um, public sector data available that is actually protected, that cannot be open data. It's about uh, having a European model for data intermediation to make sure that people can trust um, that the data, that uh, their data is not going to be used for added value services without them knowing. So we need neutrality in that market. And that's what the Data Governance Act is, is, is providing. And then there is a, another important element, which is uh, um, the data altruism. Now, what is data altruism about? If I want to give my body um, for scientific research after my death, I know what to do, right? There's forms for that. There is a procedure. How does that work for my data? If I want to give my traffic data for improving um, the, the traffic in Luxembourg where I live, um, what if I want to give my health data uh, to improve the, uh, the efficacy of the, the uh, measures against COVID? Well, there's no clear procedures in place. There's no structures in place. And also their trust is going to be paramount. Last but not least, in the, in the Data Governance Act, uh, we want to make sure that uh, member states learn from each other and also that um, they look at cross-sectoral issues related to interoperability. Interoperability is mostly tackled within a specific sector. But what about the cross-sector aspects where a lot of the use and a lot of the, the economic growth can come from in the coming years. Well, that is not really, that's not really looked at uh, properly. And, and Europe is not well represented in the, in the different um, standardization uh, arenas there. Okay, that's the first instrument, that's on the table. The, the second instrument um, is the Digital Market Act. That's about gatekeepers. It's about market power of gatekeepers, including market power based on data. So it's not a specific data instrument, it's a gatekeeper instrument. The data plays an important role there. Um, a third measure is about real open data. It's about making sure that um, data gathered based on money paid by the taxpayer is actually used in the best possible way for society and for the economy. So. Uh, we're going to adopt an implementing act under the Open Data Directive. Open Data Directive was, was changed in 2019. Um, and this implementing act will define a list of high value data sets. And this is perfect material to work with for, for SMEs. Uh, with a computer and the data, they can actually start uh, innovating. Now, then there will be our piece de resistance, which is going to be the Data Act. The Data Act is going to be about fairness, in the allocation of the value of data um, among the actors of the data economy. What do we mean by that? Well, think for example of a, a smart object you have in your home, a smart fridge oh, or, or a smart dishwasher, right? Um, the, the data that's been produced, is it my data because it's my fridge or my, my dishwasher? Or is it actually the data uh, of the producer of the, of the fridge or the dishwasher? Well, you can think about the same question for cars. Uh, or in an agricultural sector, you can think about the same thing for, for a tractor. Uh, is it the data of the farmer or is it the data of the producer of the tractor? Or actually, should the aftermarket also have uh, access to the data? Or going further, 
certain data that's produced by, by business, should governments uh, have the possibility to use it under certain circumstances? So the business to government data sharing. Now, that's the type of issues that we're still looking at in the context of the Data Act, and that's going to be a, an interesting adventure. I will leave it at that uh, for my introduction and very happy to uh, continue discussion. And thanks again for inviting me uh, to this panel. Thank you, Ivo. Thank you very much. This, this I think, helps us all get a, a clear picture of what is a complex uh, uh, situation and a complex set of, of tools. In, in trying to prepare for today's panel, I, I spoke to, uh, to knowledgeable people about such matters who, for example, thought that the Data Act was just a short uh, name for the Data Governance Act. They're two totally different things. I think uh, your presentation has helped us and will also can serve as a foundation for other discussions that uh, I'm sure we'll be having in the future. So we come now to our third speaker of, of, of this panel, uh, Locke Murrell. Locke is a professor of global ICT law at Tilburg and uh, a senior of council the off is important. Uh, I, I had to look this up, uh, lock it, but it is important and it's, uh, it's, it's higher level than just senior counsel. Uh, with uh, Morrison and Forster, uh, which is a leading global technology law firm, uh, she is, uh, among others, a member of the Dutch Cybersecurity Council, and she's a cybersecurity expert for European research and innovation programs, the Horizon programs, for example. She is a close collaborator of our good friend and colleague, Paul Timmers, uh, with whom she co-authored recently uh, uh, a, a, an article entitled Reflections on Digital Sovereignty, which I recommend uh, very highly. And among the awards she has received, I want to single one out, which is the International Global Excellence Award for Most Influential Woman in Data Protection Law. So, look, I can help us see how uh, all that we've heard up, up till now, all these building policy blocks uh, can, can, can fit together uh, towards uh, constituting a successful strategy for European digital sovereignty. Look, it's all yours. Uh, uh, microphone, please. It's at the lower left corner of your screen. You have to move the cursor there. Uh, Sorry, I to... couldn't find the bottom. Didn't the button uh, didn't show anymore because I shared. Ah, okay. okay. Please go ahead. Great. Thank you very much. Well, there is a total fascination in Europe with uh, tech sovereignty, and let's try to decode it uh, a bit. There is no, it's a political term what sovereignty is. It's no firm definition. It's about territoriality, the people, jurisdiction, nation states, and it's about internal legitimacy. So the recognition of the people, huh, the, the, that they accept their government and the external legitimacy is when a state is accepted by other states. So what is digital sovereignty? And there is in fact it, that you can decide autonomously on, your, on the essential aspects of, of our, hey, your systems and your digital future, but it is also the longer term impact on ecosystem, economic ecosystems, society and our de democracy at large. And within the digital sovereignty, you have the data sovereignty that is then having access, uh, having control over the storage and processing of data and who has access there too. I found quite uh, telling that uh, the commissioner uh, Breton said European data should be stored and processed in Europe because they belong in Europe. That is very protectionist. I hope you, you, you recognize that. And as a technology uh, lawyer, that is not, I think, the direction uh, we should go. But let's, let's have a look what, what, we, what we 
think is uh, right. And let's start with why we think our digital sovereignty, our data sovereignty is so much under threat. Being a cybersecurity expert, uh, um, we see that if your critical infrastructures are in fact in, in, hacked or, or infiltrated by uh, foreign states, for instance, that can have a real world impact. So let's, let's make that clear. The second thing is that in Holland, uh, a week ago, all our um, intelligence services, so both the military and the general intelligence services, actually warned that all our top companies with top technology, etc., are completely emptied of their technology by Russia and China. We see digital extortion taking place here with ransomware uh, attacks. We see misinformation, fake news, which uh, if you're not in control of your democratic processes and the uh, uh, elections, I mean, that is a threat to your internal legitim legitimacy. And we see that critical functions are into infiltrated like our courts, for instance, uh, the German courts for terror terrorism cases were infiltrated by uh, state actors. If you're that type of institutions are infiltrated, it is very difficult to say that you have digital autonomy, huh? that you, you have sovereignty in that respect. The second thing why uh, things are under threat is, is the tech called war going on. Huh? Uh, the technologies are a global battlefield for supremacy. Who's, who's winning the race on AI? Who's the leader in FG, 5G, uh, chip technology, etc. And that is extended by uh, to um, who is, has the best apps and leading apps and who has control over data. I mean, um, uh, the TikTok uh, uh, apps are uh, forbidden now in the US. China blocked it all because they're worried about all their data being in uh, a Chinese uh, cloud. And this was under Trump still, but um, it, it, it was, the I think, the, the, the 10 clean of the rules for the clean network. Uh, clean carriers had huh? no technology companies from China having a stake in, in, in the telecommunications infrastructure in the US. No uh, Chinese apps, untrusted apps in the US uh, app stores, but also a clean cloud. So no U sensitive US data in clouds of Alibaba, Tencent. If you think about that, that those are the rules in the US and that at this moment, uh, uh, nearly all EU data, whether it's of companies or citizens, is in the US clouds. It gives you pause to think what, what the rules around that are. Yeah? If the US government wants uh, to use cloud services, they issue a request for proposal for a US dedicated government cloud. Can everybody go on mute? Thanks. And then we have an issue with uh, a very limited number of tech companies dominating uh, 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 the space in this, uh, in this area. And they're best in class, and, and not only in cyber security, but also uh, about the integrated analytics tooling in their clouds, for instance, that they offer. There is a lack of interoperability between those clouds. So if you're in a cloud with Microsoft, you use their cloud, you use their analytics tooling, they, those clouds are proprietary. It's difficult to move between clouds. Uh, uh, they are vertical hyperscalers. And that is uh, why the European Commission is looking at those European data spaces, because if you are a tech, a, in a certain industry sector and your data is uh, in a Microsoft cloud and you want to combine that data with other parties in your uh, uh, sector, but they use a different hyperscaler, it's very hard to combine them while using your services. And you have to take them out, put them in a different uh, data space, etc. Um, if you're 
using foreign uh, providers, they are regulated by foreign countries and they have their own rules for privacy, for security, for access by data, by, of data by governments. And you must have heard about the Schrems case where the European court said, look, uh, you may transfer data to the US, but you need to protect it uh, properly. And the standard contractual clauses we devise are valid, but you need to take implement additional security measures and to protect the data of European citizens. We'll talk about that in a second. And another thing is, is that they hoover these big tech companies have so much money that they hoover up a lot of our new technologies, our startups and integrate them in their proprietary systems. Well, I think we had a reality check. Uh, uh, we already heard it. Uh, COVID brought a lot of uh, issues and it suddenly people just realized in Europe as well. How are we going to be in charge of our future? It makes a difference where medicine is, is, is uh, manufactured because if, you, if the, 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 the factories are not here or the uh, ingredients, you need to get them from somewhere else, you're are more dependent than if you would have, have everything under control. So where our research programs, uh, Horizon 2020 was open to the world, we suddenly saw uh, in all the speeches uh, of the commission that we say, look, we need to have mastery and ownership of key technologies, yeah? artificial intelligence, uh, quantum computing, etc. And we saw that also when Angela Merkel kicked off the EU presidency, it is about technological and data sovereignty. I hope you all see that that is a big U-turn to where we were coming from in 2017. It was nearly uh, cursing in the church if you would talk about European sovereignty. And this is where the Gaia X initiative came from because we said, look, we can't make a new hyperscaler like the big tech suddenly for cloud, we need to scale up in a different manner by making things, the clouds and the suppliers more interoperable so you can scale up by working uh, together. We need them to offer choice where to store data and we're going to work with data spaces so we can get enough data together from an industry sector, whether it's health or agriculture, in order to have enough data to actually uh, innovate. Because what we see is people think we have a lot of data, but in my experience, the moment you want to use uh, train algorithms, uh, it's never enough data and it's never the right data. So. We're talking about data here and you think, is it all about data? But the bottom line is, is that it is sovereignty, digital sovereignty is about control, being in control of your economic ecosystems. Yeah? If you want to do big data analytics, you need artificial intelligence. And for that, you read a lot of computing power. And at the moment, the cloud computing infrastructure is the best suited and that will become the foundation of our European innovation uh, infrastructure. If you have a lack of control over the key technologies there, if you don't know how cloud computing can be scaled up, it's hard to do the edge computing proper in a proper manner as well. Um, if you don't have control over AI, that introduces new in, uh, dependencies. Huh? AI may facilitate uh, cyber attacks by allowing existing vulnerabilities to be detected and exploited automatically and on a large scale. But also automatically detecting uh, and restoring vulnerabilities in software can also be done by AI. So if we don't know how to do post-quantum uh, uh, quantum crypto cryptography, uh, that uh, will uh, in the end no longer enable us to uh, protect ourselves uh, uh, against attacks by a quantum computing computer. So we see that GDPR is considered a huge success. Yeah, by now uh, 118 uh, countries have GDPR style legislation. 
and we export it. Whenever we do a trade agreement, a free trade agreement, we impose GDPR. They need to uh, adopt GDPR. So the CEO of Microsoft even said, you know, we need a GDPR for the world. Big success. And I don't want to do diminish that in any manner, but I, I want to, to, to make it a bit more specific because we, I see now that we want to regulate AI as well. Huh? Um, we, we think that we can set the standards for responsible AI. We're going to regulate, um, uh, prepare regulation in this area as well. But if, you, if I look at GDPR, I see it protects data, but it doesn't protect our economic ecosystem. I actually see, and this is working with the big tech, that GDPR compliance actually requires innovation to comply. And that is a lot of money and innovation power. And GDPR makes the big tech actually stronger. I hear Evo talking about uh, GDPR, etc. We need the data spaces, we need AI, we need the analytics. And I tell you, I've been involved in the COVID trying to get all the data from the hospitals uh, unlocked for Holland. Uh, and we are not ready for proper innovation in accordance with GDPR. It's the other way around. We are not there to comply with GDPR. The US companies have a head start and not a bit, a lot. I'll give you one example. Our laws require that AI, GDPR requires that decisions based on AI or outcomes that are applied needs to be explainable. Current AI is a black box. The deep mind technologies are a black box and it's hard to explain. To my surprise, I thought we would innovate and make AI more transparent in the technology itself. Google, what do they do? They build a kind of skill around, so a, 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 a layer around the AI, which is a total black box and extract the explanation. My point is, um, you can, the referees never win the match. Rules do not protect. Innovation is required on the compliance itself. If you want human centric innovation, you need to innovate. And, um, I'm, I'm worried seeing what is happening in the world that, you know, the, the innovation on the compliance is where we are actually behind. Another thing, GDPR protects us, huh? the, the shrimp's decision requires additional safeguards. But if you implement homomorphic encryption, where data is also when in use, encryption of data at rest is possible. Encryption of data in transit is really well possible, but mostly till now, for data in use to apply analytics, you had to first decrypt it before you could work with it. Homomorphic encryption is a manner to actually do the analytics while also in use. Very soon after SHREMS and even before, we saw the IBMs, the Googles, at all implementing as part of their standard service offering homomorphic encryption, making it possible to transfer the data in an encrypted form and uh, without being accessed by foreign powers and still having all the data uh, in their cloud in the US and being able to do the analytics while in the cloud. I think it's time for strategic decisions and I think the European Commission is really on the right way. But I see that a lot has to happen uh, in the member states uh, itself. I see government departments deciding on, for instance, cloud computing decisions as if it is a regular IT project without looking at the longer term impact on, on our eco economic uh, infrastructure and, and ecosystem. Yeah, and if you make decisions on each and every project with, without looking at the total picture, that's what we call the tragedy of the commons. And um, um, they safeguard security, et cetera, for a specific system or a specific supplier, but we lose track 
of the bigger picture. And let's do a reality check on the digital autonomy. And I want to make it clear up front. It is not about having all the data in Europe. It is not about having all the systems here. It is not about doing everything yourself. That is impossible for each and every member state, but I think it's even impossible for the EU. Another thing is we have no clue how much money that is. And I see governments, uh, the Dutch government asking, uh, okay, oh, we have so much money, let's put it to AI and, and technology, etc. But I think we need to first have a good look at what we need to do to make sure we have some, some digital autonomy before you decide how much it costs. What are the critical technologies? What is the infrastructure we need for that? How do we get the data? What are our one-sided dependencies? Strength of, at home is strength for a member state in Europe, is strength in, of the EU, EU internationally. Yeah? And then we need to make decisions, a lot of decisions. What do we need to have ourselves? What do we need to protect with foreign direct investments? Uh, what are the strategic partnerships then with interdependencies rather than uh, to avoid the one-sided ones? And then each and every member states need to think, what is my strength? What, how do I fit in this EU uh, research agenda? What, is, what are my uh, key economic sectors? What can I contribute? Then decide how much money it will cost. And for me, then, you know, I, I love the Kaya X, but in the beginning in the Netherlands, it was like, a, oh, yeah, nice initiative. Well, for me, this is critical. Um, why is not everybody participating? Um, uh, but also, why wouldn't we make this regulation? Um, it's a good up, bottom up initiative to think about interoperability. And, and, but if you think about, if we can't build our own hyperscalers, then it becomes very important that things are in uh, the interoperability is there to be able to scale up, but also to keep an open market, because otherwise um, this is not about keeping them outside. It is making them work for you. Um, so we get out of this bipolar question of, on the one hand, the colonialism and on the other hand, the protectionism. So with that, um, I'm uh, giving it back to George. George? Thanks, George, unmute. you have to oh. unmute. Yeah, now you are unmuted. Yeah, yeah, I, yes. it moves me back. Okay, uh, I'm unmuted now. Thank you. Uh, and, and thank you, Loke. Thank you, Loke, for your presentation, which, which uh, uh, went into the, 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 the actual processes that need to be followed uh, to, 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 to make progress if this is going to be uh, Europe's digital decade. There's a long road ahead and, and, uh, and uh, the, the complexities that you mentioned are, are definitely, you know, a key part of what has to be overcome. Uh, it's time for questions now. Uh, and I already uh, see one uh, from uh, Eric Prem that says, uh, the, there may be GDPR, but it is extremely difficult to actually pursue your rights. I think Max Schrems waited for several years to just get the first decision. This means companies can well ignore the rules for a long time. So we're back again to this uh, timing conundrum. Uh, it's, uh, the, the, this question was for you, Loke. Yes, well, uh, he's right. Um, uh, if you want to regulate, you need to have enough uh, enforcement power to, to enforce rules because otherwise they are not considered legitimate, they don't have legitimacy. And um, um, so uh, I think 
you need to give them a bit of time uh, to get their act together, all the, all the supervisory authorities, and, and you see the first big fines coming out now, but you're right, uh, it has taken uh, a very long time. And, um, uh, but blaming everything on the enforcement uh, is, uh, I, uh, yesterday somebody told me GDPR doesn't work because the regular, the, the, it should also apply to the, the suppliers who deliver the technology because it's very much directed at the controllers of the data. So whenever you develop technology, then it should also apply so you have privacy by design. But the moment you do that, um, the controllers would be off the hook. Huh? And um, uh, they, they, it, everybody is looking at each other, but the bottom line is that we need to take ownership of our own rules and innovate there as well, rather than complain about the uh, about others. Thank you, Aloke. Uh, uh, questions, please raise your hand either physically or electronically or send me a chat message. So I know there's Paul Timmer, so I see an electronic hand up. Paul? To uh, all the three speakers, congratulations. I found this really interesting and uh, engaging. Um, if we talk about uh, digital colonialism, strategic autonomy, uh, data sovereignty, that's of course uh, par excellence geopolitical. And in the geopolitical relationship, the, one of the most important is our relationship to the United States. And um, my question is, uh, how do we look at the United States? So I guess that uh, in uh, talking about strategic partnerships, it could be a partner, uh, but some other people may say it's at least a competitor. And I think with the past Trump era, era we would probably have said it's a systemic rival. And perhaps some people would actually argue it's a real colonizer of Europe. Uh, and then, so I want to see, uh, hear from you, how do you look at the relationship to the United States when we are talking about these topics? And the second question actually taking into account to make it a bit more difficult, uh, there are elections going to be in two years time and in four years time. And so we will have to, if we want to work together with the United States, have to invent something that can survive a possible regime change again in the United States. So do we just give it up on that? Do we hand it over to the industry, which is, seems to be more stable than governments? Do we give it to civil society also more stable? Do we just look far ahead into the future, like whatever quantum computing in 2035, we can work together on that. So what is your, your view on, on working with the US? Okay, thank you, Paul. Uh, Pilar, you want to, to have a go with this? Please unmute yourself, you, you're muted. Okay, now it's okay? Yeah, it's fine. Okay, fine. Well, just uh, regarding the, the uh, intervention of Loki, which I think was excellent. I mean, she has a very open mind. So, and I appreciate very much. I mean, seeing all the different uh, with, uh, real deepness uh, problems that uh, sometimes in the European Union, we tend to, um, let's say, uh, be in a bubble. Sometimes it's difficult to see all the faces, all the angles, and then it's very welcome. Uh, you know, to have these approaches uh, with, uh, you know, more critics uh, on, on, on the GDPR and, and other aspects. Uh, but then also not forget that uh, still uh, regarding the GDPR, we need the e-privacy regulation, which is now again in place. That was not possible because there was not the possibility to get any agreement between Parliament and Council last uh, uh, legislature, last term in Parliament, uh, and now is there because it's precisely the one that is going to try to be the connection from the uh, GDPR general principles to the adaptation to uh, at the digital level. So this, uh, but regarding the EU US, it's very interesting. I mean, of course, I mean, th th that was a, a new possibility with the Biden administration that was uh, with the previous one, with the Trump ones, everything was uh, really uh, impossible that I respect. The TTIP never was, uh, you know, uh, had a chance uh, to, 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 to have a, a, a possibility of going on. Um, let's see what happened. I mean, probably with the Biden administration because the previous experience of uh, this president, uh, the possibility for the, uh, let's say, open new ways for, for reinforcing uh, the EU-US 
uh, relationship would be bigger. I mean, we have not to forget that with Obama, Obama, which was such a glorious president for, for so many, I mean, and this and that, and it's not to represent the, the ambers of, of Trump in some way, but regarding Europe, he was more uh, with the, the view on, on the Pacific side more than the uh, EU side, no? But, but there is something new um, that was casualty in some way, you know, with the Brexit and the UK in place, a number of things could happen in terms of, for example, uh, data, uh, data rules. Uh, I mean, to now uh, they have, and still they have our own uh, regulation, the same regulation that ours, because they were uh, here. Now with the Brexit, one of the agreements was six months of uh, under construction uh, of data transfer uh, to see and to check if uh, the, the rules in the UK still have the adequacy, uh, you know, that can match with uh, our uh, rules. But but what happened with uh, when when the if the UK um, let's say uh, mm, try to get an agreement with the US and then this is triangle the triangle with the the, the EU the US and the UK in terms of data transfer is interesting because in some way there could be new ways of uh, find find new possibilities for the you know a develop a development in this in this uh, field at least in the area of data we have the EU US, US summit in in um, in this in June I think in June July uh, and new possibilities is open there in any case I think it's clearly that if we think in, in, in uh, you know in I mean in, for for the European Union. Uh, that's clear that, I mean, uh, we have to, to look at, at once and again to the U.S. I mean, we cannot uh, lose this uh, perspective. This is uh, it's, it's a competitor, but it is, uh, you know, a region, I mean, a country, a country in this case that they share uh, the, the essence of uh, the same views in terms of um, market economy, in terms of uh, values in general. And... Um, we have uh, not to, we can't, it's a must not to lose, never the perspective of really get, uh, you know, uh, agreements of any kinds, uh, you know, different kinds, and never quit uh, on, on, on that, even with the difficulties uh, we are accustomed to. So uh, it is uh, my view. Thank you. Thank you, Pilar. Uh, a quick question uh, to, to, to Evo from, from me. Uh, it has to do with this uh, timing question. I don't want to be perceived as getting manic about it, but uh, uh, oh, 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 oh. In, the, in the case of cloud services provision, uh, th there's the recovery fund money coming into the member states now, I mean, in the next few months. Uh, in my country, Greece, for example, there's a huge campaign to get companies to to, to go on the cloud, huh? because, um, uh, but there's no European uh, cloud uh, yet. So uh, in, in Greece, for example, it's Microsoft that will, you know, will take all this. So are, are we in some way shooting ourselves in the foot by, by not dovetailing pro properly some of these instruments? Evo. Yeah, no, 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 thanks. Uh, that is indeed uh, a challenge uh, that uh, the initiative is starting and the recovery fund money is available now or actually for the for the coming few years so there uh, we must make sure that at the end of the day we are not shooting ourselves in our own foot as, as you say and to make sure that this uh, strengthens the european uh, cloud initiative by the way um Loka, you said that um, IAX, it's not clear whether, whether member states will subscribe to that, but actually there was a ministerial declaration on eCloud Federation that was signed by all the, all the member states. Eh? So um, it's in October of last year. So, so there is really the willingness to move forward um, together. If I may come back for a moment to the, to the international aspects, um, because when when we uh, actually published the data strategy, I got the question, well, is this data strategy against anyone? Is it against US companies or against China? Is it protectionist? And the answer is no, it's not. This is about the way in which we as Europeans want to deal with data. 
in line with our values. And it's not against anyone. This is our model. And people are very welcome uh, to come to Europe and actually do business in Europe in line with, with our uh, norms uh, and values. Now, the data strategy expresses it as being open, and Europe is open, but assertive. Um, and our commissioner sometimes adds uh, not naive um, in, in the international context. So I think that is what, what really summarizes our, our international, uh, well, the international aspects of the data strategy. Thank you, Ivo. Maybe, George, I can add something on the international aspect, because uh, being involved in, in many cyber incidents and, and being part of the Cybersecurity Council, I, I see a lot where the attacks are coming from. And I'm not saying that the US intelligence services do not access data. I mean, that, that is uh, 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 clear. But I have never encountered in all this time economic espionage from, uh, uh, from the US. While it is systematic from China and, and, and Russia. And um, therefore, I think, you know, the, the values and if, if, if I would have to make a choice where we can align and work together, it, it is impossible to work together with, uh, with countries that have different rules, have a different playbook. And um, if you want to do trade plus steal everything, and then, uh, you know, and also have export restrictions from, from whenever they, uh, uh, technology is moved outside China, um, how are you going to, to manage that? Then, you know, it's, it's very hard to, 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 uh, to align there. So, I'm, you know, it's, there's a new administration in China or in, uh, in the US. And um, I think that the, the systematic threat uh, and the, the divide is not with the US. That, that is, is, is my, uh, my opinion. Thank you, Lorca. Uh, another question? Do I see a hand? Uh, I don't, I don't see a hand either physically or, or electronically. Uh, uh, there's one, Radu. Yes. Uh, unmute, please. Unmute, please. Uh, yeah. I, uh, I put the question also in the chat. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering actually about all these cloud initiatives and initiatives what we are what we are looking uh, after. But uh, for me, it's not clear who operates the future cloud in Europe, who operates, who is trustful enough to do it, what's the business model model behind it, uh, how many uh, decades will take actually till. Uh, all member states will agree on something in common. So the question is for me is a kind of a fata morgana, which uh, it's uh, very difficult actually to 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 uh, look it uh, from a, from a, from a, yeah from a practical point of view how things will 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 be. Um, speaking about compliance, also on on GDPR. Uh, I recommend uh, those who are interested to look uh, very careful what happens at the present time in the United States in Cloud Security Alliance, uh, which provides already actually operational, uh, um, operational um, uh, environment and also uh, uh, the rules on most companies in U U US, uh, including also GDPR. So it's a lot of work already done in, on, on, on the other side uh, of the Atlantic. Uh, maybe you sh you should, uh, we should actually consider um, how this uh, works. But actually what my interest is to understand after so many years, how operational and de facto in a time, time, uh, um, time uh, let's say, uh, um, in a, in a time which is, which is our life, uh, such a cloud environment will be uh, 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 
operating in Europe and um, um, and I'm, I'm wondering actually how this uh, could uh, could happen. If you have any comments on that, I'll be very happy. Okay. This, this will be the, 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 the last question and uh, uh, who from the panel uh, should, should take it. Of course, the goal is not uh, just uh, you know, our lifetime, but this decade, this should happen in this decade. Now, these days, nobody knows if the lifetime exceeds that or not, but uh, uh, let's say the goal is to have all this in place within this decade. So, uh, panel members, who would like to, to respond to that? Ivo. Yeah. <clears throat> all right. So, so first of all, the the aim is not to reproduce simply what is there in terms of, of the Amazon Web Service or, or, or Microsoft Azure, and 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 basically oh, no. the question or is my question is who is running? Yeah, who yeah, is yeah, running? Sure. I, yeah. What is the business uh, model uh, behind uh, it? Uh, uh, please, please not let not let actually you know know, telling me is it something else and better. I, 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 I will get there. That will be something better but the question okay, is thank, thank, thank you it, it will be based on security it will be oh, based on right. low energy it will be based on edge technologies um, yeah, but... so so that is the technological future now what we see at the moment is that the biggest um, european cloud provider has one percent of the market right there are a number of small players if you don't make them join forces radu then um this is, this is not going to work. If you don't make them work together, um, that's the Cloud Federation idea. How are we indeed uh, ever going to compete? If we don't do the investments, how are we going to compete? Um, I think giving up before starting the race is, 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 is not, not the attitude we should have in, in the data world. Um, that's, and that's that is a bit what, point, what I actually. feel sorry about that it's not the point the point is actually that actually clouds and platforms and every every everything is based at the end of the day on an operational system i was actually involved in the in the creation of the um, of the microsoft cloud from the beginning on and i know actually my question was actually at that time to 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 the president of to to bill gates actually was but you are you are a, you are a, you are a, a provider of, of 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 technology. You are not you are not in the service in the operation of of, of such a such a system. And uh, look what happens. They bought actually a completely completely new uh, uh, team of, of people. They had had a completely change of change of of of, uh, of a business model in, in, into that. And that's I'm questionable. Who is responsible yeah. to do it actually at the European uh, uh, in the European Commission? Yeah, uh, thank you, thank you. I think uh, you know uh, one one more response from the panel, and we have to 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 conclude uh, because time is the master here. Uh, Pilar, would you like to have the last word? Uh, uh, microphone, please. Okay. Yeah, uh, sorry, I mean, uh, to the last uh, question, um, I have not uh, definitely a question in terms of uh, technical, at the technical level, but I, I think uh, this is, uh, must be uh, not as a movement, you know, that include all Europe at the same time, and that this and something would to be very much integrated in terms of uh, all sector of the economy. I wonder, I mean, if we, you are thinking, we are thinking on data space, spaces, for example, and you, you, we have, uh, you know, for the industry working in the health sector, and then take advantage of this uh, federated cloud. So this is a sector. And then uh, the automotion is another one. So in terms of, uh, in terms of maybe I am wrong, I mean, I said, I'm, you know, I, I don't come from the uh, tech sector and I, my, my, you say my education is in not a technological one uh, at the university level, but then, uh, uh, you know, I mean, you have to also to see it. I don't know if this uh, can in some way uh, be taken into, into consideration, you know, in your, your question. I mean, for example, the automotive uh, industry, the manufacturing industry of different kinds, uh, you know, all these things, you know, that really can be, uh, let's say, uh, segmented in some way. And then at the same time, the operational things for that sector, maybe it can be also, you know, 
develop in a way that can can fulfill with the needs for the operational need, uh, you know dimension for this. So I wonder if uh, we we have this global uh, vision that who will operate this uh, European clouds, uh, then it's, it's, it's not possible, you know, since if we have a problem with the timing, of course, we have a life in which uh, we are not going to see many of the things we are talking about just because, you know, to transpose, to, to, to implement at the European level, at the member state level, is so difficult. I mean, uh, the speeds are totally different and, and many other things are so different. So uh, taking into account all this, uh, better thinking in uh, different areas where the, the, the economy is structured uh, and different sectors and verticals, uh, you know, that will be my, my point. Maybe that's an answer to your question okay. in, in any case, but still, I think, uh, well, that's something we yeah. have to take into account. Yeah, it's impossible to have a, a, a complete answer or a complete discussion on these issues. But I want to thank uh, the panel uh, Pilar, Ivo, Locke, uh, for, 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 for this knowledgeable and intelligent input and, and, and discussion. We have a long way to go. We're at the beginning of a decade that is, that is uh, announced to be Europe's digital decade. And I'm sure that the, even in this particular uh, digital human context, we'll have to come back and discuss these issues now that we're all a bit more knowledgeable and a bit wiser about them, thanks uh, to your inputs. So with this, it's back to you, Agnes. Uh, thank you, George, and thanks to all of you. Um, I would like to hand over to Peter, so we finish with our normal way with a piece of music. And as far as I know, it's a piece of music about big data. So, Thanks for joining the discussion and for joining the Digital Humanism Initiative, which is right on the way what we have discussed here. Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, the song is actually by band called Big Data. Um, but yeah, um, I'll present it in a second uh, just to give the uh, proper um, credits here. Um, I want to thank Stefanie Vogovic for, for um, suggesting this track. Um, she's not only um, running our social media efforts and community relations, but also regularly contributes to the, to the final notes, which is traditionally our last segment here, where I'm presenting a track to transition you out of, of the lecture. So let me share the screen um, for this for this track. As I said, this is by a, by a US band called Big Data, and they made a track called uh, Dangerous. So that's not only, not only is the track a good match um, for the um, for lecture, but also if, um, this makes a, a pretty good statement. Um, so uh, for our next event, uh, which I usually announce here, um, we don't have one um, 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 uh, finalized yet, but please follow the announcements made on Twitter. Uh, on the website on, and in the newsletter. So thanks for joining uh, today. And we end with big data. Enjoy and goodbye.
Goodbye. Bye bye. Bye bye. And thank you.